Hey, long time no see. I think I found something. It's about politics. I know, I know, politics suck, and everybody's polarized lately, and frankly, it's just not fun to talk about. But I'm not here to talk about individual people, individual candidates, individual groups, or even parties, really. I'm here to talk about something deeper in American politics. Because lately, I've noticed that people all over the political spectrum are talking about something similar. Consider Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump. The Democratic National Committee recently announced it would exclude Fox News from hosting any of its debates in the 2020 news cycle, citing the channel's increasingly pro-Trump rhetoric and fears that the channel couldn't host a fair event. This is among the many reasons some DNC members were unhappy with Bernie Sanders when he made the decision to hold a Fox News town hall in mid-April. If Fox News is allegedly so partisan that the DNC won't work with them, what drove Sanders to work with the channel in a move he knew would anger his party? Why risk losing mainstream support on one side of the aisle, preaching to core constituents from the other? It's no secret that American politics have been getting more and more polarized on the surface. The public certainly feels it. Most people don't even seem to think talking about politics helps us reach common ground anymore. But as it turns out, political polarization may appear worse than it actually is. And there's evidence from at least one analysis of election survey data to suggest that a measurable chunk of Sanders supporters ultimately sided with Trump when Sanders didn't make it through the primaries. It may have even been enough to sway the election. Both candidates have been targeting working class crowds, and both candidates have been making a very bold claim that the system is rigged. And that, folks, is what this video is about. Is the American system rigged? More specifically, is the American system biased to consider the interests of some groups of people over others? And if so, is it something that happens to a degree that prevents the system from doing what it's supposed to do? What we know about this question is a very long story, but I've got a feeling it's going to be a hot topic in the next couple elections. To answer this question, we need to define what the system is, what it's supposed to do, how it's supposed to do it, and whether or not it's doing it. So strap in, we've got a lot to talk about. It's not exactly difficult to see why politicians are campaigning on a message of a rigged system. Americans are not too happy with their government right now. Confidence in many core American institutions has been on the decline for much of the past 20 years. People are less confident in the presidency. They're less confident in the Supreme Court. They're less confident in public schools. And Congress? Congress at best has a serious image problem. This jadedness regarding the American system seems to run deep. So, what is the American system actually supposed to be? Let's start at the beginning. Our independent American government emerged from an armed revolution against Great Britain over 240 years ago. The Declaration of Independence, essentially our breakup letter, made our intentions abundantly clear. It establishes some core American values, that all men, generally interpreted today to mean all people, are created equal and have certain rights that cannot be justly taken away from them. Those are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The declaration continues that governments exist to secure these rights, with power they hold through the consent of the people they are governing. We revolted because we felt the British government was ignoring those rights, especially liberty, by failing to represent the interests of Americans when passing and executing laws. We won that revolution, and in the aftermath, we built a new government, one whose goals and core mechanisms are laid out in the supreme law of the land, the Constitution of the United States of America. The Constitution is the blueprint for the core of the American system. There are lots of ways to describe this system, but broadly speaking, it's a constitutional democratic republic. It grants lawmaking or system-defining powers to a body of legislators called Congress in Article 1, Section 1. Those legislators are elected by the people of the several states as described by Article 1, Section 2 and the 17th Amendment. 
and their legislative goal, according to the preamble, is to promote the general welfare and secure the blessings of liberty for all its people, among other things. So deep down, what is the American system? Well, it's a 200 plus year old government created in response to tyranny, people being subjected to laws without consideration of their interests. The American system is, at its core, shaped by lawmakers elected by the public to represent their interests. What is it supposed to do? According to the people who created it, it exists to promote the general welfare of the American public, to protect our unalienable rights. This is reflected by American values today. An overwhelming majority of the US public at least partially agrees that our society should do whatever it takes to ensure everyone has an equal opportunity to succeed. How is the system supposed to achieve these goals? Through a representational government and the quote, blessings of liberty, protecting us and future generations from leaders who act outside the interests of those they govern. Now that we've defined what the system is, what it's supposed to do, and how it's supposed to do it, we can look for evidence to see if it's rigged. If our system is functioning as intended, no one group of Americans should have significantly greater representation than another, regardless of how much power they have. America's population is big and diverse, so some variation is to be expected. I would argue that's just being realistic. But there shouldn't be drastic differences in whose interests are considered when it comes to our government. We're about to get into a lot of nitty gritty data and research on money, representation, government, responsiveness, and even a little bit of occupational licensing. If you want the extra short version, feel free to skip to the conclusion. But where's the fun in that? To probe for any of these drastic differences in representation, we can look to elements of society that give different groups of people different amounts of power. That is, the ability to influence events and other people. Differences in power are fine, but they shouldn't exist at the clear expense of things like liberty. After all, we didn't overthrow British rule just because British nobility held more power. We did it because that power led the British government to enact unpopular policies without representing colonists' interests. Now, modern America does not have a true nobility or formal class structure. Power dynamics here have frequently been complicated and tied to who people are and what they look like. For example, to varying degrees throughout American history, the color of your skin, whether or not you have a wiener, and what you openly did with your wiener could have serious implications for your ability to control your own destiny. For our purposes, though, it's worth casting as wide a net as possible. If we're probing for evidence of a broken system, it makes sense to look in places where its brokenness could affect the most people. And when it comes to systemic power in America, there's nothing quite like money. The sheer scope of the differences in income, and therefore power, that exists between Americans today is somewhat of an anomaly. Over the past 50 years, the American economy has pulled off some wild growth, but that growth hasn't happened across the board. After taxes, average income for the bottom fifth of Americans has grown roughly 69% since the late 1970s. Nice. For the middle three-fifths of Americans, so most of you watching, that growth was only 42%. In most cases, this growth has been mostly stagnant since the recession in 2008. For most of the top fifth of Americans, this growth has been a little better, 73%, and generally higher than the other two. And yet, for the top 1% of Americans, we're generally talking millionaires here, income has grown by 228%, over five times that of the middle Americans. The end result is that, in terms of income, the richest 1% of Americans pull in vastly more money than most well-off and middle-class Americans, let alone the poor. To bring things down to earth for scale, we can consider this in terms of hourly pay. If the top 1% are making $20 an hour, the average well-off Americans in the top 20% are only making a little over $4 an hour. The Americans in the middle, by comparison, make about $1 per hour. Those in the bottom half, only about 25 cents. But the top 0.1%, they are making over $90 an hour. Of course, I've scaled these amounts drastically lower to make them easier to visualize. 
In reality, the 234,000 people that make up the top 1% pull in an average of $6 million each year, or a little under $2,900 per hour for a 40-hour work week. That means they pull in more money in 15 seconds on average than the bottom half of Americans earn in an hour. The reasons for this uneven growth are complex, but in short, it's got to do with how most Americans make their money. Most Americans, even fairly well-off Americans, make their money primarily by selling their labor. They work for a wage and get a paycheck. Unfortunately for most Americans, these labor wages stopped growing in line with the rest of the economy in the 1970s. Today, they're well short of the growth seen in US labor productivity. The minimum wage has fared significantly worse. The main source of income for the 1% lies elsewhere. While they also sell their labor, wages only make up about a third of their income. The rest comes from business income and capital gains, most of which have seen some more drastic growth since the 1970s. Now, the point of all this isn't to vilify the rich. Making ludicrous amounts of money on its own isn't necessarily a bad thing. I mean, that's a big part of the American dream, right? But it would be a bad thing if that power meant their interests dominated the American system. The richest Americans amass their fortunes through parts of the economy that most Americans don't interact with much. Considering some really crucial things like, well, retirement, healthcare, and education are heavily determined by how much money people have in this country, people with vast amounts of the stuff could have a totally different experience with the American system. Their interests in key areas of governments could be quite different from those of the rest of the population. If our system is extremely responsive to money, those interests could consistently win out, even if they are clearly opposed by, or even harmful to, the majority of Americans. That would be evidence the system is not functioning as intended. It would be a big blow to the Republic and to American liberty. So let's look at the research. To the extent that we consider policy responsiveness an indicator of liberty, a lot of researchers have actually asked these questions in the past. Does public opinion correlate with policy outcomes? According to most of the research of the past 50 years, yeah, it actually does. Unfortunately though, much of this research looks at the public as a whole and doesn't make distinctions between groups within the public. This is an issue because it assumes that elected officials are equally responsive to the views of all their constituents. Given the scale of that money power dynamic we just discussed, that may not be a safe assumption. If the government is highly responsive to one group within the general public, and especially if that group is usually in agreement with the rest, the government may appear responsive on average, despite not actually considering all the members of the population as politically equal. Researchers have only started looking more closely at the relationship between money and political representation in the past two decades or so. One of the largest recent studies to try to determine this relationship is documented in the book Affluence and Influence by Martin Gillens of Princeton University. In it, Gillens used survey data from a variety of news media and national polling firms to code for how the public felt about a variety of issues. This included hot political topics like healthcare reform, missile defense, and NAFTA. But it also included a bunch of more mundane topics like allowing motor vehicles in federal wilderness areas, classifying tobacco as a drug, and making Martin Luther King Jr. Day an official federal holiday. He then used the survey results, which included income data and statistics, to estimate the policy preferences of low, middle, and fairly high income Americans, the first, fifth, and ninth decile of Americans, respectively. Then he and a bunch of research assistants compared this public preference data to actual policy outcomes within four years of the survey questions. The results were startling. On the surface, they lined up with past research. There was a clear relationship between public preferences and policy changes at all income levels, in line with what models predict of a fairly responsive government with a bias towards the status quo. But that relationship was largely because most Americans happen to agree on a lot of issues across the board. To determine whose interests our system is most responsive to, Gillen's isolated issues where the income groups diverged. And that's where things get dicey for liberty. Simply put, 
When this happens, the relationship between preferences and policy for poor and middle class Americans practically disappears. In both cases, the relationship between the affluent and policy change stays roughly the same. These findings were so stark that Gillens and another researcher, Benjamin Page, summarized and added to the analysis of the data in the widely publicized paper testing theories of American politics, elites, interest groups, and average citizens. In this paper, they do more to explicitly analyze the influence of interest groups on public policy, which is also significantly higher than that of the low and middle income American public. They conclude that, quote, when the preferences of economic elites and the stands of interest groups are controlled for, the preferences of the average American appear to have only a minuscule, near zero, statistically non-significant impact upon public policy. This paints an extremely pessimistic view of the American system. If it's supposed to secure the blessings of liberty for all Americans, this would indicate a stark failure on that front. It's worth noting, though, that this data set is not the end all be all here. This is a fairly new area for research and trying to determine the preferences of the public and then match them to policy decisions is no easy task. Coding these sorts of things takes a lot of time, will likely always require a degree of subjectivity, and can yield small sample sizes. At least three alternative analyses of the data by scholars at Cornell, Princeton, the University of Texas, and the University of Michigan suggest that the gap between representation of the rich and middle class may not be so severe, especially when it comes to actual outcomes. Nevertheless, a notable gap still appears to exist, and none of the studies in question have refuted that the poor aren't severely underrepresented. This smaller but still serious gap is illustrated in Larry M. Bartell's Unequal Democracy, Second Edition, a research piece that focuses more specifically on the partisan elements of the political economy. Bartels looked at district-level survey data from the Cooperative Congressional Election Study conducted in 2010 and 2012. Unlike Gillens, who considered specific policy outcomes, Bartels tried to quantify the ideological position of the public on a variety of topics, then compared those positions to roll call votes made by members of Congress. His findings suggested that the House of Representatives is about twice as responsive to high-income Americans as it is to middle and low-income Americans. But in the Senate, it's really no contest. The interests of the poor barely even register, and the high-income Americans see roughly five times the responsiveness versus middle-class Americans. A comparison between the Senate in the 1990s and in the early 2010s suggests that representation of the poor is an old issue, but massively increased representation of the affluent over middle-income Americans may be newer. The way parties fit into all of this is honestly a topic for its own video. But in terms of responsiveness, Bartels is able to illustrate differences between the parties. Both parties illustrate the same problem. High income responsiveness is clearly ahead of both middle and low income responsiveness. In the case of the Republican Party, these disparities are more extreme. Responsiveness to low income Americans drops sharply. Responsiveness for middle income Americans actually increases but responsiveness for high-income Americans increases sharply. But again, the partisan element to all this is complex and worthy of its own video. Both parties are operating within the same system, and both parties show clear responsiveness bias toward the interests of high-income Americans. Before we draw our conclusions on questions of liberty in the American system, it's worth noting one other area where evidence exists that differences in power could be hampering people's equal consideration by the American system. A report from the Brookings Institution suggests that growing occupational licensing regulations for various jobs in the labor market may be lowering wages and driving unemployment for unlicensed workers. Compelling arguments exist that low standards for the implementation of occupational licensing have allowed industry insiders to seek out and protect regulations that give them an advantage over others. Consider any of the notorious cases of lemonade stands being shut down for not having the right permits. Nevertheless, while some who make this argument will suggest that regulation, not income inequality, is the cause of economic stagnation for most Americans, I would suggest that these things are not mutually exclusive. 
These findings may be symptomatic of the larger problems with representative responsiveness laid out earlier. Gillens and Page note that the net alignments of most influential business-oriented groups are often negatively related to the wishes of the average citizen, and those groups have greater impact on policy. If insiders within business-oriented groups do in fact proliferate policies that hamper competition, their ability to do so may be bolstered by the responsiveness our lopsided system appears to give them. And that, folks, brings us to our conclusion. Is the American system rigged? Well, if you define the American system as one that is supposed to represent the interests of all its people, even sort of equally, then yeah, it looks like it is. The research we just covered lays it all out pretty clearly. Martin Gillen's data set and accompanying analysis of government responsiveness suggests that the interests of affluent Americans and interest groups easily beat out those of middle-class and poor Americans. While researchers have noted that middle-class Americans might have more influence over policy than Gillens concludes based on his analysis, a clear difference in responsiveness remains, and none of the examined research refutes that the poor are severely underrepresented. Similar research by Larry Bartels reinforces these findings. Responsiveness is skewed clearly toward high-income Americans in the House of Representatives, and significantly more so in the Senate. This research may be new, but if the problem is even close to as bad as it looks, we've got a serious issue on our hands with American liberty. These effects are slightly mitigated by the fact that high, middle, and low-income Americans tend to agree in most policy areas, but there are some very important ones where they don't. While it can be difficult to adequately survey the ultra-rich in the United States, Bartels did make an attempt with a small sample size in 2013, and found evidence that the wealthiest Americans might disagree with the general public on key issues. These include issues like whether or not to cut spending on Medicare, whether or not the government should focus on making sure everyone can find a job, or whether or not the government is obliged to spend whatever is necessary to ensure all children have good public schools. Does this mean that the rich people are the bad guys here? Well, no, it's probably not that simple. For the most part, their preferences do align with most Americans. The same survey I just mentioned even suggests that they're almost as concerned with income inequality as we are. Before we can get to looking for bad actors, we've got to consider the problems within the system itself. Campaigns in the United States cost a lot of money. They are funded largely by the candidates running them, and much of the money they receive from donations comes from high-income Americans. Direct campaign donations aren't even the whole picture. Individuals can also give money to parties, PACs, independent expenditure groups, and lobbying organizations, some of which don't even have donation limits. In this context, our system doesn't seem to reward those who best represent its people. It instead seems optimized for rewarding whoever can scrape together the most money. When a growing number of people are making earth-shattering amounts of money, and they live and work within a system that runs on said money, is it really so surprising that that same system responds more to those who feed it? This is a problem we need to solve. As we saw earlier, looking at economic trends, most of America's income growth is slowing or stagnating, while America's richest, whose income often comes from different sources, continue to amass wealth at a rapid pace. If you're watching this, it's likely you're not doing as well as you should be given the economic growth this country has experienced recently. As the economy continues to leave much of the population behind, there's a growing body of evidence that this sort of widespread income inequality can be extremely damaging to the general welfare of society. If you're watching this and you're a part of the wealthy group of Americans who aren't experiencing these problems personally, hi, good job on the stuff you've earned, congrats on the stuff you didn't, and please help because this concerns you too. Oftentimes, the people on the bottom rung of the social ladder are the first to start experiencing some of the more insidious problems in our society. That's not to say that you don't have very important problems too, or that we need some sort of revolution. But if our system for addressing problems in society has a blind spot regarding a big chunk of said society, those wounds could fester and lead to instability that benefits nobody, 
Some things, like access to health care, are a matter of literal life and death for these people. A lot of people who are born poor in this country tend to stay poor right now, which suggests that bootstraps might not be enough to get out of crippling poverty at the moment. That's not a good sign. Y'all might lose out a bit more often with a government that's responsive to more of its population. But a lot of Americans have been losing out for some time now. Ignoring problems like these indefinitely tends not to end well. The British learned this the hard way in the 1700s. We need to be asking ourselves how we might dislodge money from responsiveness in American politics. Maybe we could fund campaigns with taxpayer money so the people running them can focus on the people paying the taxes and not the money. Maybe we just need stricter campaign finance laws to put a cap on how much money campaigns can take and from where. Maybe we need to further insulate our system from lobbyists and other special interests. Maybe we could divert, divert. Maybe we could divert a fixed portion of every American's taxes to a campaign of their choice. We could come at this problem from a variety of angles, but our current back and forth and reluctance to trust or compromise with each other isn't getting us anywhere. At this point, throwing stuff at the wall to see what sticks may be a better option than freezing and doing nothing. Whatever we do, we need to make the American system one that protects the interests of its people again. One that promotes liberty and opportunity for all, including those who are struggling to make ends meet. When you do vote, try to exercise your right to liberty as an American, try to keep that in mind. Is your preferred candidate busy getting in fights with the other rich people in Congress? Are they telling you which individuals and groups of people you should be afraid of? Or are they talking about specific approaches to fixing the deep problems that exist within the system itself? I hope you all vote for people that are doing that last one. Because it isn't going to unrig itself. Told y'all it was a long story.